look at a single hidden layer in a neural network, what exactly it does. So we already looked at, let's say these are the inputs and these are the outputs. Uh, now, instead of having a direct connection between the inputs and the outputs through a single nonlinear function, uh, let's add a layer and then instead of sigma, I'm using G and F here, but it's the same idea. Uh, we are just using a different notation. So now we have added this layer. So you can see that first of all, there is no interconnection between layers. So that is not there. And there is no skipping of, uh, of layers. And there is no connection that is coming back from, from a previous layer. So it's not arbitrary connection of neurons. It's only a layer wise connection of neurons. So here, all the neurons here are connected to all the neurons here. And then all the neurons here are connected to all the neurons here. So that's the structure, basic structure of a neural network. It's uh, for several reasons why this is the basic structure as opposed to an arbitrary set of nodes and connections. So let's say if you have an arbitrary set of nodes and connections and anything can be connected to any, any other node, that would be another way of having a neural network. But this uh, particular layered structure has uh, advantages in the sense of uh, uh, from the point of view of anal analyzing how they behave. Uh, for training them there are no loops when you are doing the training and passing the gradients around and so forth uh, so these are directed acyclic graphs directed acyclic graphs that means if you follow the direction of the arrows you will never have a cycle in the sense that you will never return to the same point from where you started so that's a directed acyclic graph uh, so in these neural networks you will always have a structure like this now what is happening here is that we have these inputs and on top of that we have these uh, we multiply all of them with the weight matrix w1 right so let's say this is x times w1 and then we pass it to some nonlinear function which point wise computes a nonlinearity so what does this mean if we have a sigma times w1x that doesn't mean that this is a scalar this is not a scalar it's a vector but sigma is a scalar function uh, which is applied point wise to each element of that vector and the output is treated as a vector of the same dimension as that of the input to the function right. and then uh, we will use that so basically this is your sigma times w1x or g times w1x right and then we have w2 and what we get finally is your y y is a vector here y is equal to uh, f times w2 times uh, so it's matrix multiplication with a with, with a let's try to write it in a single line so y is equal to f times w2 times g times uh, g of w1 times x okay so uh, y is f of w2 times g of w1x so this is layer one this is layer two okay. uh, so what is this first layer doing we know that inside that sigmoid function g we have a linear function which is w1 times x so that linear function with a sigmoid function is actually dividing the input space defined by x1 and x2 and x3 into three different half spaces three different pairs of half spaces this is the division of uh, in half space one this is in half space two and this is in half space three so what that means is we are drawing some hyperplanes on the x1 x2 x3 space using three different hidden neurons and based on that we are uh, we are dividing the left side and the right side of those half spaces and treating that as a new feature for the output so with that we are introducing nonlinearity. so uh, let's say we we want to classify we want to find a, a, a boundary between all the positive and the negative points in this particular example so we have a bunch of positive points here we have a bunch of positive points here and then we have one positive point here and then we have a, a whole bunch of negative points so we have negative points here negative points here and negative points here so obviously a single neuron 
that shows you this boundary is will not be able to classify between the positive and negative samples and uh, so this uh, single line is what is uh, what is uh, the decision boundary of logistic regression this boundary can shift left or right if we have a different threshold than compared to 0.5 uh, but what will happen is essentially it's going to be a line it's going to be a hyperplane of n minus 1 dimensions in an n dimensional space uh, but we don't want a hyperplane we want nonlinear classification so what we are doing is that we are introducing a hidden layer the hidden layer is dividing each neuron of the hidden layer is dividing the input space into half spaces using these hyperplanes right so basically the in the hidden layer each of these line represents one neuron one neuron of the first hidden layer so what's a hidden layer hidden layer is so if you have the inputs you have hidden layers and then you have the output layer right so this is your output layer so this is your hidden layer so this hidden layer it's each neuron is basically dividing the input space into uh, into two half spaces the positive and the negative half spaces and combinations thereof can now be used by the next layer to do a finer division of the input space to find out the positive spaces and the negative spaces now these spaces are not going to be uh, defined by a single line but by combinations of lines because of the hidden layer so that hidden layer basically gives you these combinations of lines so that's how you can model more complicated functions but keep that in mind that whenever you want to model more complicated functions it should be justified by a larger data because more complicated functions of small data just leads to overfitting and it should be verified by a rigorous validation process or cross validation process uh, so that those kind of logics still apply to neural networks but we will be uh, we are introducing these hidden layers to basically model more complicated functions now uh, let's take another way of visualizing these uh, what these hidden layers are doing right so what we looked at earlier was let's say we have we are doing regression right so let's say we have x right and we have t and what we are given are a bunch of training points which are forming some smooth function uh, and we want to find f of x which comes as close to these points as possible now if your f of x is a constant it's nothing but then what we will get is basically just a line that i can move up or down and how close it comes to all of these points is anyone's guess and that's not a very useful function so now let's look at another function which is uh, uh, this uh, f of x is equal to w1 x plus w0 right so that particular function can be any kind of a line and the line that comes closest to all the points in a mean square sense is probably the line that i will go with and that's one kind of a function that i can model right so that doesn't come very close to uh, that may not come very close to uh, some interesting set of points that you see here so now what i can do is i can take one level further and i can say that i want to model this as w1 phi1 of x plus w2 phi2 of x okay plus b so what is phi1 and phi2 these could be powers of x or these could be uh, Fourier features of X and so forth uh, some fixed set of features so what I'm saying is that I have I have this line and I have this parabola take a linear combination of these two and uh, based on the linear combination I can move the parabola up and down right using B and I can move the parabola left and right using uh, using X and uh, based on that i can get any kind of a parabola right so i can get and let's say i can get some parabola that fits these points so that is the fixed feature extraction that we can do 
uh, that can try to come close to these lines uh, to these points then comes support vector regression in support vector regression let's take the kernelized form where we are going to say is that f of x is basically uh, sum over i, i is the number of training points, i is the index over training points and we are going to take kernel of x, xi right and these are only those that belong to the support vectors and then basically we are going to have some weight wi and then plus b. I'll skip the plus b part. So what that is saying is that we will find some points that are support vectors on those points we are going to have kernels and then we will take a linear combination of these kernels so we will either bump one of these kernels up or one of these kernels down but the location the center location of the kernels cannot change the, the center location of the kernels can only occur at one of the training points okay and then i can have some sort of a combination of these that may come closer to the points that i have so that's your uh, support vector regression and similarly we have support vector classification now let's take another example where what we want to do now is we want to use a neural network okay. so in neural networks we will fit some sort of a kernel function or some sort of a basis function right we can fix fi uh, we can have a basis function but the location of the basis function need not be at a training point it can move anywhere and we can have uh, the number of basis functions that we will use is is a hyperparameter that we can change so let's take a basis function i can have one that is here and one that is like here so this may, may not even be at a training point and i can add actually finer and finer number of uh, basis functions and i can stitch them all together by appropriate weights by bumping them, them up or down and then I can have a very good approximation of the function that I'm trying to model. Now how do I uh, shift them left or right is by using the biases of the hidden layer. How do I bump them up or down is by using the weights of the second layer Okay, and how do I change uh, other things about it is by using different kinds of uh, weights and biases in the two layers so now let's be more specific now let's use sigmoid but since we promised sigmoid right so basically what we are saying is that let's say we have a sigmoid uh, we have multiple sigmoids right and whether they are positive sigmoids or negative sigmoids depends on whether the weights are positive or negative for that particular uh, hidden unit Right, that particular hidden neuron and they are, uh, how fast they rise and where they are located whether they are left or right or whether they rise smoothly or they rise very fast that depends on the weights and the biases of the neural network so based on that we can and then their final weights are basically what we get in the uh, weights of the final layer so the height of these uh, of these different uh, uh, sigmoids are going to be the weights of the second layer whereas how fast they rise are going to be the weights of the first layer uh, or the mod of the weights of the first layer the l2 norm of the weights of the first layer and their how where they are located where their central point is that is the biases of the first layer and then overall how much further up i can raise the whole thing or lower it down that is the bias of the second layer so that is you can that's how you can think about these but we have actually more flexibility than choosing just sigmoids we will see that in a bit but the idea is that we can use a combination a repeated combination of a canonical function by shifting it left or right by stretching it uh, in the x direction by stretching it in the y direction but the shape doesn't change we just stretch it or move it around add it up multiple versions of these things up and we get an arbitrarily smooth function uh, uh, that can touch any sets of points or come very close to them and we can get better and better approximation again we don't want to have uh, too good of an approximation if we don't have the data to justify it that will lead to overfitting but those kind of uh, things can be tested by looking at how the the validation works out 
So all this comes from the universal approximation theorem by Sabanko and uh, uh, and uh, some of his colleagues or contemporaries at that point. Uh, basically, this uh, theorem suggests that if we have a smooth function, right? If we have a smooth function sigma, which is not a polynomial, right? And we have a compact interval. So let's take x. What is a compact interval? Let's say I draw. Uh, some lower limit and upper limit and these are not like limits that go into infinity these are finite limits uh, so this is within some uh, boundaries a and b that's a compact within this compact i can have any function right i can have any function f of x provided it is a well behaved function what is a well behaved function it's a smooth function let's say it's its derivatives are finite and the second derivative is finite and so forth or it could be continuous in the Lipschitz sense that it uh, I can draw a cone at any point uh, with finite slope and the function will lie within the cone for any point within a and b so it could be uh, something along those lines and I have a lot of flexibility in choosing Sigma this uh, this nonlinear function that I will move around using w1 and that I will bump up or down using w2 and I can put this in this particular layered form where there is only one layer and the only flexibility that I want is that I can increase one of the dimensions of w and the corresponding dimensions of w2 the, cor the dimensions of w1 and w2 that match together so if x is of dimension let's say t cross 1 then w can be w1 can be of dimension let's say h cross d right and your output let's say is 1 then it is your w2 is going to be of dimension 1 cross h so this h is my hyperparameter so the number of hidden neurons in the first layer is my hyperparameter i can change that around if I'm allowed to increase it, it's a positive integer. If I'm allowed to increase it arbitrarily, then I can come within an epsilon error, plus minus epsilon error of the function fx using just this particular form for any function fx, provided it's not discontinuous and, and, and it uh, doesn't have infinite derivatives and so forth. Uh, so just that, that that's it. We don't have to specify uh, sigma to be uh, to be uh, to be a, uh, a sigmoid function. It can actually be any kind of function. It can be Gaussian. It can be it can be uh, rectified linear unit, which is zero on one side and identity on the other side of origin and so forth. Okay. So what that means is that I can. Uh, so if you think about it a little bit more carefully, let me change the color here. All I need to do is take this sigma and basically divide this into small intervals very small intervals right and within small intervals so let's say my sigma is nothing but a step function not a step function a pulse function right i can move the sigma around and i can place it anywhere right how can i place it anywhere i can place it anywhere by changing the the bias in the w1 matrix assuming x also has a 1 and I can uh, move it around by by changing the the weights of w right and uh, the other thing that I can do is I can the finer tessellation means I will need more such step more such pulses and more pulses means I will need more hidden neurons right so that will more finer tessellation of that space and depending on how fast what is the maximum rise in any interval right so and then what's its relation to epsilon error that error tolerance that i want based on that i will need finer or coarser tessellation of this space that means i will need more or less hidden neurons but i can i can arbitrarily uh, come close to this yellow function using using a sum of shifted pulses i can come close to them using shifted uh, using shifted sigmoid uh, sorry sig, uh, uh, shifted uh, Gaussians I can come close to it using uh, uh, pairs of positive and negative sigmoids to, to create like Gaussian type effect so I have a positive sigmoid and I have a negative sigmoid if I 
add the two up or subtract the two uh, I can uh, uh, and add and add a bias I can create a function like this right so I have different choices of this nonlinear function it just has to be nonlinear it cannot be linear it cannot be an identity function otherwise I don't get this and it cannot be polynomial either uh, we will not get into the proof uh, but then for all the for a wide range of functions I can model arbitrarily close to it I I'm not guaranteed what's gonna happen outside the interval so outside the interval I don't know what's gonna happen but for a compact interval I can uh, assure that I will be able to model any function now we can generalize this to n dimensions we can we can threshold this function and do classification so if we don't threshold it it's regression if we threshold it it's classification so there are all sorts of possibilities that come out of this uh, universal approximation theorem then there are generalizations of this universal approximation theorem where we can even increase the number of neurons so we can have features the first layer is a feature extractor then we have features of features then features of features of features and so forth and based on that our modeling power keeps on increasing so actually we just need a neural network with a single hidden layer just that the number of hidden neurons can be very very large for complicated functions such as image recognition uh, and for such functions it might be better to simplify some of it by introducing layers.